Hello, and welcome to another video about linear algebra. My name is Patrick Naylor, and I'm one of the instructors for Math 235, along with Graham Turner. In this video, I'd like to take a look at one of the problems in section 7.1. Okay, so here's the problem. It's question 7.1.8 from the textbook, and it asks you to prove that if two n by n matrices, A and B, are similar, then they have the same rank. Recall that two matrices, A and B, are called similar if there's another invertible matrix, S, such that S inverse times A times S is equal to B. My goal for this video is to show you how I would approach a problem like this and to give you a different way of solving this problem. If you have a look at the solutions for the textbook, you'll find a different solution there and you should compare it with this one. One of the things that I first think of when I see this problem is the dimension theorem or what I like to call the rank nullity theorem for matrices. We'll see why I say that in section 8. Remember, the dimension theorem says that if A is an M by N matrix, then the rank of A, which is a dimension of the column space, plus the nullity of A, which is the dimension of the null space, is equal to N, or the number of columns. Some of you might have been wondering if there's a way to use this theorem to solve this problem. Maybe, instead of worrying about the columns of these matrices, we could worry about the null space. In fact, there is. Let's see how to do that. We know that A and B are similar, so there's an invertible matrix S such that S inverse times A times S is equal to B. Note that this means that A times S is equal to S times B. This doesn't seem like a huge change, but this is actually a really common trick. Instead of having S and S inverse around, I now just have S. Let's see why this is useful. Well, we want to understand the null spaces of A and B. Recall that the null space of A is just a set of all vectors, X, such that A times X is equal to zero. Now, I want to note the following. If X is in the null space of B, then S times X is in the null space of A. Why is this? Well, if x is in the null space of b, then b times x is equal to 0. But then a times s times x is equal to s times b times x, by the above note, which is equal to s times 0, which is 0. So, s times x is in the null space of a. In other words, we've found a connection between the null space of a and the null space of b. This is looking pretty good, but I think we can do better. Let's look at the following claim. If v1, v2, all the way up to vk are a basis for the null space of b, then I claim that s times v1, s times v2, all the way up to s times vk are linearly independent. Remember, we just showed that these are all in the null space of a. In fact, this is exercise 5.1.10 in the textbook. If you're following along, Pause the video and see if you can prove this for yourself. Alright, well, now let's prove it. Consider a dependency relation among these vectors. That is, for some real numbers, c1, c2, all the way up to ck, we have that c1 times s times v1, plus c2 times s times v2, all the way up to ck times s times vk, is equal to zero. Well, by linearity, we can move the constants in between the matrix and the vectors, and then by linearity again, we can pull the s out of all of these terms. So we get that s times c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 all the way up to ck times vk is equal to zero. But remember, s is invertible. So if we multiply both sides on the left by s inverse, we get that c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 all the way up to ck times vk is equal to zero. Since s inverse times s is the identity matrix, and s inverse times 0 is still 0. Since v1, v2, all the way up to vk are linearly independent, the only way that this can happen is if c1, c2, all the way up to ck are all 0. In other words, we've just proven that s times v1, s times v2, all the way up to s times vk are linearly independent. So, why does this claim matter? Well, this means that the dimension of the null space of A 
is at least as big as the dimension of the null space of B. If the dimension of the null space of B is k, then we just proved that there are k linearly independent vectors in the null space of A. So we get the inequality I've written there. Similarly, if we reverse the roles of A and B, and S and S inverse, because inverses come in pairs, we can get the other inequality. That is, the dimension of the null space of A is less than or equal to the dimension of the null space of B. You should check this if you don't believe me. Since we now have both inequalities, we conclude that the nullity of A is equal to the nullity of B. That's great, it's exactly what we were after. Now we can apply the dimension theorem. By the dimension theorem, we know that the rank of A plus the nullity of A is equal to n, since A is an n by n matrix, and that the rank of B plus the nullity of B is also equal to n, since B is also an n by n matrix. So the rank of A is equal to n minus the nullity of A, which is equal to n minus the nullity of B, which is equal to the rank of B. This completes the proof. I hope that you found this video helpful and that it gave you a different perspective on this problem. Whenever you're trying to prove something in linear algebra, always keep the rank nullity theorem, or these kinds of theorems, in the back of your mind because they're very useful. Well, that's all for now. Study hard and good luck.